So it will be Genesis 9 and 2 Corinthians chapter 11. All right, I'm going to give something very interesting right here. And then uh, I'm also going to uh, be fair on the critic side, okay? Because this is a very deep teaching, very deep teaching. Now, I want to stress this to people online so that they can learn something here. This is an important lesson, otherwise you're not going to grow properly as a Christian, and you're going to have an unhealthy balance. When you come to deep doctrines, okay, deep doctrines of the Bible, you got to realize this. When you cover deep doctrines in the Bible, it's very important to not just uh, dismiss it as, well, I totally disagree with it. That's blasphemy. That's heresy. It's very important not to do that. Because when it comes to deep meat doctrine, that's something you can't make a quick conclusion on. It's something which is what I'd suggest to put on a shelf, okay, until God gives further light. And you know that's my discipleship training. That's what I've always taught. Okay, you've got to be doing that. I don't want you to agree everything that I'm teaching automatically, okay, even with deep stuff. I want you to study and search for yourself. So you got to realize this, is that I'm not telling you to agree with what I'm teaching here, but I'm also telling you not to disagree with what I'm teaching here either. What you should be doing is to put it on a shelf until God gives further light. That's extremely important. And you do that with deep doctrines. Heresies and blasphemies are easy to disprove, you got to understand, with Scripture. Okay? It's very easy to do that with Scripture. But deep doctrine, how we know that's not heresy, is that when there is scriptural references here, and it cannot be disproven, but it, the reason why it's deep is why? Because it's very few in verse references, and you have to dig in a little more. That's when you know it's a deep doctrine that you can't dismiss automatically as heresy so easily. Okay? It is very important to understand. Unless it's clearly disproven by scripture, then you can dismiss it as heresy and blasphemy with whatever deep doctrine there is. I mean, you got to realize this. Daniel, he wrote a lot of crazy things at the book of Daniel, what he saw, right? Don't you think that a lot of people would think, you're crazy, you're nuts, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you got to do the same thing in my case right here. You can't just dismiss it as crazy and nuts so easily, okay? It takes time. Daniel's a deep book, see? But it's, but it's still true, see? Okay. Now that I explain myself right here, let me just say this uh, as quick as I can. Uh, but I want to cover all the interesting parts too. Okay, first of all, in the Garden of Eden, something happened with Eve and the serpent. There's something weird that happened right here. Now, I gave a lot of videos on this, but what I gave uh, the reference to that was that something physical happened between Eve and the serpent. I can't even spell physical right. <laughs> okay, physical. Something physical happened between Eve and the serpent, possibly. Possibly. I don't teach it as a fact, but there's something possible that happened. But not only that, something sexual as well. So physical and sexual together. I'm not talking about a spiritual reference. Spiritual reference is a no-brainer. That absolutely happened. But something that's physically and sex physically sexual, I believe it's possible. Now, some people misunderstand, and they think that, uh, that I teach that Satan, he actually had sex with Eve. I don't teach that, okay? What I teach is this, is that I don't think that Satan, uh, I don't know if Satan actually just went to Eve and just had sex on the spot with her, okay? I don't have that kind of a clear passage. But something he did with Eve that was sexual and physical, see? So I don't know. It may not be the normal sexual interaction like how humans do sex today, see? Satan, he just did something weird that we don't know, see? Well, what is it, Pastor? We don't know. You know why? God does not, God sees it as so evil that he sees it fit that you don't need to know, okay? There are some things where people dig so deep into on so something so evil and wicked that God sometimes does not want you to know. You ever thought about that? Mm -hmm. See? So that's something important to understand. But what God does want you to know, though, what he wants you to know is a basic outline of it so you can be aware of his devices, see? 
but you don't need to know exact details of what Satan exactly did because it grossed your mind out. And then it just grieved the Holy Spirit within you, see? Okay, so here's the idea. Something physically and sexual possibly happened with Eve and the serpent. Now, this is shown at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a what? Chaste virgin. See that? Chaste virgin. But look what Paul defines this as chaste virginity. See, you want to keep yourself chaste and a virgin. Why? Because he uses the example. Why does he use the example of Eve and the serpent? Verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. See that? So 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 through 3 shows that there is a sexual reference right here. And how we know that it's physical is because of Genesis 3, which we won't turn to, but you saw it so many times in my other videos. You saw it so many times in my other videos that Genesis 3, what did God tell Eve? God told Eve this, is that basically that your seed and what? The serpent seed is going to have conflict. Now, you might say, well, the serpent seed is not uh, literal. It's probably spiritual. Okay, but what about Eve's seed? You're saying that Jesus Christ is a spiritual figure, or was that literal and physical? See, in that context, it's a physical seed. But not only that, why is it that God cursed Eve? You know what God's curse upon Eve was? It had to do with her relationship to her husband, submitting to husband, as well as bringing forth children. Why would it relate to something, these two curses, it relates to what? This incident. She was cheating on her husband with something, see? Something with that physical sexual interaction there. Bringing forth children. Now, this is not the most interesting part of the teaching. <laughs> so I hope that you're still watching. Okay, here's the thing. We had Noah's flood, right, that drowned, that drowned it all out. Because Genesis 6, we had this Nephilim, this seed that came out from Satan that's just so messed up, okay? It was just so messed up. So God drowned it out with Noah's flood. But here's something interesting. Why do we see them again after Noah's flood? You got the giant with six fingers and six toes. You got uh, the Anakims, who are so tall that... There had to be two Jews that carried the grapes of what the giants had. See, that's how tall these guys were. So this Nephilim, this reptilian mutant stuff, seemed to revive again after Noah's flood. Why is that? Eve <coughs> sinned with the serpent concerning what? It was a fruit, right? Isn't that sin repeated again with Noah? Now, this is something interesting. From whose line do you see the giants? This is crazy, okay? You ready? You ready for this? Okay, let's look at Genesis 9. Genesis 9. This is crazy here. Now, look at Genesis chapter 9 and verse 18. This is very weird why the Bible will emphasize this. Verse 18, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the what? Father of Canaan. Why would the Bible emphasize that? Ham is the father of Canaan. Think about it. Now, why don't you look at your Bible, okay? We don't have time to look at these verses for time's sake. I wish I could do it, but that would just make the video 30 minutes, and that will just be too long, and then I'd be tiring out my members, and we'd yeah, stay till midnight. <laughs> Shh, be quiet, be quiet, okay? Shh. <laughs> but anyway, if you look at uh, Deuteronomy 2, I believe, from memory, and then uh, you have to look at uh, Numbers. I'm surprised I still remember this from memory. 
Numbers 13, if I recall, it mentions the giants. And these giants are also known to be from Anakim. And where do they live? Where are they at? Canaan. Why would Nephilim come from Canaan? See, ask yourself that question, please. Why would the giants and Nephilim come from Canaan if there wasn't something that happened with Canaan here? There's something weird. Something weird here. You ready for this? All right, this is going to blow up your minds. Here we go. <clears throat> Look at verse 21. What did Noah do? And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. There's a sin with the fruit right there. Certain sin with the fruit right there that happened. Adam and Eve were the first, uh, were the ones who procreated the, the whole race. Noah was given the same thing, and you can see a repetition here. See? There's no coincidence. There's no coincidence. There's a reason here. Okay, let's keep reading. So he was drunken, and he was, what, naked in the tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan. Boom! Why would it add father of Canaan here? It's so weird. Because that particular interaction may have something to do with Canaan. But keep reading. Saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Okay, he just saw the nakedness of his father. No problem, right? Well, look at verse 24. And Noah awoke from his wine. But look at this. And knew what his younger son had done unto him. He did something here that made Noah mad, okay? Not just looking at him naked, okay? He did something that made Noah do something very bad in a curse. Verse 25. And he said, Cursed be who? Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. Noah cursed Canaan. Now, this is so weird. Why would he do that? And remember, giants Anakim come from where? Canaan. I mean, uh, what's really interesting, I don't know if you knew this, but if you look at chapter 10 in Genesis, if you look at chapter 10 in Genesis, what does it say about Ham? Verse 6, And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim, and Foot and Wo, and who? Canaan. But also keep reading right here concerning Canaan. Look at verse 15. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the what? Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the what? Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvadite, and the Zemorite, and the Hamathite, and the afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. Now look at that right here. You'll notice right here that all these uh, tribes that come from Canaan, now if you look at Deuteronomy 2 and Numbers 13, it will mention Anakim, and it also mentions Amorite. And it mentions some of those tribes' names as well. It's very, very strange here, see? It said the giants live there. That's what it exactly said, okay? So why there? Why from Canaan? Unless something happened right here with Ham and Noah, and he's called the father of Canaan. Uh, you're making assertions, Pastor. Well, look at right here, okay? This is why I'm very convinced something happened. One, you got to think about this, okay? Ham, we can all agree, Ham did something more than just see his father's nakedness. That ticked his father off. The verse said that... Um, no one knew what his younger son had done unto him, that he would curse him. See, something so bad that he would curse him. Deja vu with something that Eve did that was perhaps sexual and physical, that God had to put a same curse upon her concerning what? Childbearing concerning children. Wow. Same thing with Ham's children. See, there's no coincidence here, oh, okay? Goodness. But, um, uh, you know, to clear up all doubts, okay, this is the most convincing one. Okay, keep, now look at right here. Verse 20, uh, 21 and 22. When he drank the wine, saw the nakedness of his father, right? This is sexual when you look at Habakkuk 2. You ready for this? Get ready. Look at Habakkuk 2. Look at Habakkuk 2. Wouldn't now be a good time that we just close Bible study, you know, and call it a night after no, that? No, 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 no. <laughs> Look at Habakkuk chapter 2. 
people say Bible study is boring after this, you know. <laughs> Look at Habakkuk chapter 2. Look at this now, okay. This is, <laughs> this is something else. 15. Woe unto him. And uh, before I read this verse, think about this. That's what people are doing right now. What people are doing right now is that it's ever since the beginning of history to now, mankind's nature has not changed. People like to make someone else drunk so that they can do something sexual with them. That has been an innate nature of man. So why not all the way back then ever since Noah? Where did we learn all learn that from? It's an innate nature, instinct. But, but look at this one. This verse will blow you up. Verse 15. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. See, make him drunk. Why? That puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also. That what? Thou mayest look on their nakedness. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, right there. See? Sexual. There's no doubt. Uh, look at verse 16. This is very plain. Thou art filled with shame, for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy what? Foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand. Okay, you get it now? Oh, there wow. is something sexual, okay? That's why the Lord wow. for that's why the Lord forbids drinking wine here, okay? You know why God hates wine? This is why it's an important sometimes deep doctrines can give important lessons. Because you gotta realize this an important lesson to understand is that if we see this serious origin that happened back then with wine, it would make sense why God hates you to drink liquor and alcohol and wine. There's a history back there. But look at Habakkuk 2, 15 through 16. You see that? But what did it say at Genesis? Remember at Genesis 9, what happened? Noah drunk and Ham saw the nakedness of his father. That matched perfectly with Habakkuk 2, 15 through 16. You make the person drunk so that you can what? See, look the nakedness. That is a sexual reference. But let me tell you this again. But this does not make sense, uh, you know, with two men, obviously. That's why I'm telling you something weird. We don't know details like this one. There's no coincidence. There's no coincidence. A lot of the, the ever since the beginning of the human race, the beginning of the human race, there's always been similarities with Noah's family and Adam's family. There's no coincidence right there. So the thing is this, is that just like this thing was abstract, this case is abstract. We don't know exactly what happened, but I do know this. There's something sexual, there's something physical. But it's not hard to believe because if you have the power of Satan involved, don't you think he can get anything to come out after that? See? So, you, look, you got to realize this. Satan can give birth to mutants and reptilians just out of his mouth. Didn't you know that? Look at Revelation 16 if you don't believe me. So he can do something weird with this, these incidents. Not a problem with him. See? So, uh, weird stuff right here. Now, let me cover... Uh, I want to close the video right here, but I want to cover the critic's argument so that you can understand right here. So I can understand that some people uh, that this kind of stuff is like really deep. But look, I showed you scriptural references and a lot of connections in the Bible that are very, very strong. Okay? So in, with those things, you can't just automatically dismiss it as heresy unless you prove it. See? Unless you prove it. Now, one of the cases how they prove it, I'll cover their strongest one. Okay? The strongest one is Genesis 4. We'll look at Genesis 4. So, um, in my other teachings, I mentioned that Cain, it's possible that he could be literally of that wicked one, see, so to speak. But, they argue against that because of Genesis chapter 4. And then we'll look at verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife. See, the man had the relationship with Eve. And then after that, what? She conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from a Lord. Uh, and she again bare his brother Abel. See that? So basically Cain should not be the physical seed of Satan, so to speak. Why? Because Adam's relationship with Eve was the one that gave birth to Cain. Now here's a problem here, okay? I think you, 
in my largest viewed video, if you watch that one, Satan has a son, I already argued something here. In verse 1, Adam had sexual relationship with his wife. And after that sexual relationship gave birth, what happened? After that, when she conceived, she gave birth to Cain and Abel, I argued, okay? Now, I'm not going to explain it again, okay? I already covered it in my other video. So here's the thing. That's a scientific fact called superfecundation. See that? Two different fathers. Twin birth from two different fathers. So this is very simple, okay? Satan did something weird with Eve, and then after that, Adam had sexual activity with Eve, and then after that, what? Twin birth. See that? Cain came out first, then Abel. See, that's the simple explanation right there. Super fecundation. Twin birth from two different fathers. So it doesn't change that fact right there. It's very possible you can still connect the two together. All right? You didn't disprove it right there. But here's another thing. I noticed when you read the King James Bible, it gives that. But if you look at modern Bibles, they change the wording and the meaning. See that? Modern Bibles do that. So when people try to disprove this twin birth thing, as well as Cain being the possible offspring of Satan, you have to use modern Bibles to make it more clear to do that. That's something else. You have to go outside the King James Bible. But this is their strongest proof text. See, the strongest. But I've already explained that one. Uh, here's another one. Another argument that they would use is that uh, they would teach that this is a teaching by Gnostics. That's what they would try to do. This is a teaching by Gnostics, and then later on, William Branham revived this argument about the serpent seed. Now, uh, you gotta realize this, is that the thing is, is that I don't obviously agree with all the details. Remember, I said I don't know the details here, okay? I don't agree with all the details of what William Branham and the Gnostics taught about the serpent seed stuff, all right? But I do believe there was something physical and sexual. Now, if you accuse me of that being the Gnostic teaching, that I got it from Gnostics and William Branham, my simple argument against that is, no, look at the Bible. I got this from the Bible. I didn't know about this Gnostic stuff and William Branham stuff, actually. I already knew this many years ago. I knew this many years ago. I just never taught it until probably last year or two years ago uh, because this was such a deep doctrine. And yet I didn't know that this deep doctrine was the one that would get most of the people to watch us. But anyway, point is this. Point is, is that my argument is it's just Bible, see? Well, let me give you a very easy example right here. Do you believe in Noah's flood? Yes, you do, right? I could say this. No, that's a pagan Babylonian myth. That's a Gnostic teaching right there. And then you might go, no, it's not. And I'll say, yes, it is, because I can show you documentations, writings from Gnostics, Babylonians, and pagans who taught Noah's flood. And scholars teach the Bible was written when? After the Babylonians and the pagans wrote. Why do you believe in Noah's flood? Because of the Gnostics? No, because of the Bible, right? That's the same thing with my case right here, see? So I see that as a, uh, that kind of argument is actually, no offense, but you got to really understand here before you judge me quickly. That's a liberal college argument. And that's, those are the last group of people you'd like to assimilate yourself with. Amen. Amen. See that? All right. So that's another thing right here. So uh, in this teaching, I hope you understand, uh, there's not a lot of strong criticism against this, actually. I covered, uh, there's too many connections that is too plain. Not a coincidence, but not only that, plain verse references right here, plain verse references. But it would make sense with a lot of other questions too, because if Satan really wants to attack the seed, okay, that God promised against him, that I'm going to get a seed out of the woman, don't you think Satan will obviously attack the physical, literal seed somehow? Of course he would. Don't you think he would do it at the start of the human race? Of course he would. That would make sense. Not only that, another thing is this. Wouldn't it also uh, make sense where Genesis 6, where did the sons of God learn that kind of sexual activity with humans from? Why would they do that kind of stuff? Something they learned from their daddy? Yeah. That's 
See that? So it makes a lot of sense, see? It makes a lot of sense. Now, here's the thing. Like I told you before, you don't have to believe this, okay? Because this is a deep doctrine, all right? It's very deep doctrine. So you don't have to believe in this, but don't dismiss it automatically as heresy and disagree so quickly either because there's a lot of connections here, and it would make a lot of sense on some of the warnings that God would give to you, and it could be even helpful so that we are not, uh, so that we are not ignorant of what? Satan's devices. Don't be ignorant. He did something at the beginning of mankind and the second time of the beginning of mankind. He did something that we shouldn't be ignorant about and so that we can be aware of what he's doing in our world to corrupt it. How else can he bring a literal human antichrist, right? See? Recent knowledge that I've learned, and these are some of my e church members too, actually. So they also brought up some ideas to me. I'm very open-minded, see? I'm not the type that just shuts out people. Right? I'm very open-minded. All right, so I just heard recently that uh, that aliens that they would do some they would do something anally sometimes for sexual for sexual see for something sexual anal probing stuff like that. But not only that, also the lust of the eyes with the aliens. That's pretty interesting. But the Bible also says, "Ye are of your father the devil. The lust of your father ye will do." See, so there's a lot of interesting connections right here. So see, this basic outline, see, not exact detail, but this outline, where, basic outline where you know, can open doors to a lot of other things that would connect the dots. You see that? That's the point right there. It would make sense in a lot of other things. But uh, not only that, 2 Timothy 2. So here's another uh, argument, which I forgot to cover. A lot of people, they'll argue that... Uh, if you insist that when Eve ate the fruit at the garden, that that was something sexual, Adam ate the fruit too. So then you're saying that Adam committed homosexuality with Satan. Here's the easy answer to that one, okay? Like I told you, okay? Eating that fruit wasn't the exact detail of the physical sexual encounter, okay? It was part of it, but, it has, uh, but that wasn't the main thing. We, like I keep repeating, I hope people understand this. I don't know the exact details. All I know is this. When Eve ate the fruit at the Garden of Eden, Satan, Satan then, after eating that fruit, Satan, what he did afterwards, he did something physical and sexual. See that? So here's the thing. When Adam ate the fruit, Satan didn't get involved in that. In fact, Eve gave the fruit to her husband, right? So Satan had no activity interference there. Satan only focused on Eve. See that? So the physical sexual thing, we don't know where it comes from, how it happened, what the details are. All we know is when Eve ate the fruit at the Garden of Eden, it wasn't just eating a fruit. There was something more to it that Satan did with her. See that? But this is definitely proven that Adam had nothing to do with Satan's activity with 2 Timothy 2. Okay? 2 Timothy chapter 2. So I have to mention this part. We're going to look at uh, 1 Timothy 2. Sorry, I apologize. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we will read verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11. Now remember Eve's curse that related... Okay, so the physical and sexual thing with Satan, it's very interesting that the curses would match up with this, right? It would relate to her relationship with the husband. That's why God would say, submit to husband. Submit to him. Don't go under the control of Satan. That's why you shouldn't submit to Satan and the Bible mentions, submit yourselves, therefore, to God and resist the devil. See? Okay, but anyway, the second thing is children. Children birthing. Okay, it's interesting that the two curses would relate to this kind of physical and sexual thing as a, as a result, consequence. It would also make sense, why would he give this kind of consequence? These consequences come from a source. Why would they give you that exact consequence unless it's related to that source? See that? The source has to be related to the consequence. 
Okay, anyway, aside from that, 1 Timothy 2. Here's the thing. Let the woman learn in silence with what? All subjection. See, relating back to right here again, submitting to a husband, which could relate to this, because keep reading right here. By suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in, in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Look at verse 14. And Adam was what? Not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. See that? E Eve was deceived by Satan. Adam wasn't deceived by Satan. Satan beguiled Eve. 2 Corinthians 11. Genesis chapter 3. Beguile. Satan beguiled Eve. Beguiled means charm, seduce. See that? Satan did it with Eve, not with Adam. See, that's the easy debunking to that one. But not only that, look at, uh, because she was deceived in the transgression, you see childbearing here at verse 15. Why would it talk about children birthing after that? Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. What in the world? See that? Why would it relate to children birthing as well as... Uh, not failing your relationship with your husband. Why would it do that? There's a lot of interesting things right here. So because of this passage, this would easily debunk the argument about Adam having sexual activity with Satan too. No, that's not the case. I'm doing this abstractly. I don't know the exact details. I wish I could tell you, but you know why I can't tell you? God made it silent for a reason. Do you know why he made us silent? He doesn't want you to know all the gross, wicked, evil details. Do you think God wants you to know the exact wicked details Sodom and Gomorrah did and stuff like that? He's not going to. He doesn't want that because it's so wicked. He wouldn't tell you. Did you study satanic rituals? If you study Satanism and rituals, it's enough to grieve your Holy Spirit. You want to shut it off. It scares you. It grieves your spirit. See? That's how wicked and evil Satan is. That you don't need to know what happened with Noah and Ham. You don't need to know what happened with serp the serpent and Eve. You don't want to know the exact details. But it is important to know the basic outline of it. That way we can be forewarned and be careful of Satan's devices. You don't need to know the exact details of the satanic rituals. But you do need to know the basic outline of it. That way you can see how evil they are and avoid them, see?